All right, so now we're recording. Um, so, so I guess first of all, basics is that um, your your final is on Tuesday morning at 9 a.m. Uh, if for whatever reason you can't make that Tuesday morning um, time, I'll do a 5 p.m. on Tuesday as well. Uh, so, so make sure that you're able to attend at least one of those two times. Um, what else? Uh, you guys have one more assessment due, uh, and that's your Unit 7 assessment, which is the, um, the, the PowerPoint that you're making for, I think they said middle school level kids, or you're, you're kind of directing it towards a younger age, a younger audience, and so you're teaching a younger audience about the reproductive system. So not awkward at all and lots of fun. So um, you guys uh, try your best to narrate that PowerPoint, because um, I would like to hear all your, your voices talking about, um, talking about this stuff. Um, and if, if you can't, if, you, if your microphones aren't working or something like that, uh, then, then what you can do is just in the notes panel on the bottom of each slide, put what you would have narrated, so type it out down there, uh, and then get that submitted by Sunday night. Okay. All right, so let's start looking through this study guide here. So we're gonna start way back um, at the beginning and talk about the endocrine system here. Um, so your endocrine system is just that system of hormones, right? The main point of it was um, control, right? So it works together with the nervous system to communicate across the body. Um, we classified our hormones into um, two major categories depending on their molecular structure. So, so we've got the, the steroid hormones, which are uh, lipid soluble, and then the non-steroid hormones, which are water soluble, and those are mostly made from uh, polypeptides. Um, so between those two different types of hormones, um, the, the either the steroid or the non-steroid, which one uh, is able to enter directly into target cells? Say that one more time, I'm sorry. Uh, which of the two different hormone types is able to enter directly into a target cell? I believe it's the non-steroid. Uh, isn't the that the lympho, it's not hydrophilic. No, no. Yeah, so both of, yeah, both of what y'all are referring to are the, the protein based ones. And those ones don't, they're not able to get directly in. Um, so uh, the steroid hormones, which are the ones that are modified versions of cholesterol, those ones can enter directly into the cell because they're lipids and the cell membrane's lipids, so they can just pass right through. Okay. So those ones get in um, that way. How do the, how do the non-steroid hormones get into a cell or get their message into a cell? They have to have like a protein base, right? Right, so they have to um, find a, a receptor on the surface. And then they and the they, receptor sends the hormone inside of the cell. Perfect. Well, so not the hormone itself, but a second messenger. Right. So it'll take that hormone message and it'll turn around and send another second messenger to the inside of the cell. Right. So, so that's how they get in. How do they travel in the bloodstream? Which one are you talking about? Either one. Give me one or the other. I think the steroid that's the lympho or the lipid um, that has to transfer by protein and the other one is hydrophilic. It can transfer through the blood, correct? Perfect. Yep. So the, the steroid hormones need uh, protein carriers. So they're hopping on like albumins and stuff to carry them around in the bloodstream. Whereas the non-steroid hormones don't need any of that. They can just travel around because they're, they're hydrophilic. All right, uh, difference between endocrine and exocrine. Mm. 
one goes directly into a duct and the other um, directly to its target. Perfect. 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 Yeah, so the, the exocrine hormones um, get released into ducts on their way to wherever they're going. Or they're not technically hormones, exocrine substances. Um, and endocrine means that the gland is producing that hormone to be released into the bloodstream for distribution all over the body. Right, so exocrine substances would be like, um, like saliva, uh, sweat, uh, things like that. Whereas, did I make those markings on the page? I don't understand how computers work. Um, whereas endocrine substances are um, things like all, all of your hormones that get released into the bloodstream. Okay. All right, and so, and then I included a little chart here to help you guys um, sort of remember all of the, the major um, hormone feedback loops. So we should, you should refresh yourself on all of these pathways. This chart looks really confusing, um, but once you start digging into it, you'll, you'll, you'll kind of figure out, you'll remember what these different hormones are. Um, so remember that, that your pituitary is the master gland of your endocrine system. So that's the one that's releasing most of these different hormones and it's controlling most of the other glands. So right, a lot of these anterior pituitary hormones are being directed towards the thyroid or the adrenals or the gonads or wherever else. Um, and most of the, well, all of the pituitary function is guided by the hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus is your connection between um, the nervous system and the endocrine system. So remember that the hypothalamus releases um, releasing hormones and then those releasing hormones tell the pituitary to release its own hormones. Okay, all right, so that's the endocrine system. Moving on to cardiovascular. Um, so you should remember the order of blood flow through the heart and all the structures. Um, so, so make sure you take some time to kind of review that. Uh, so if we start at the, at the right atrium, what's the valve that we go through next? The tricuspid valve. Very good. Tricuspid to what chamber? The left atrium. Mm, right ventricle? Ventricle, right. yeah. Yeah, yeah, right ventricle. Um, and then from right ventricle through what valve? The um, pulmonary, it starts with the P. Yep, you got it. Pulmonary semilunar valve. Um, so pulmonary semilunar valve to the pulmonary trunk, which divides into the right and left pulmonary arteries, which go to the lungs, uh, and then pulmonary uh, veins return back to the heart. When they return back, they go into what chamber? Left atrium. Good. Left atrium through what valve? Bicuspid valve. Bicuspid Bicus or mitral. Oh. And then into, into the left ventricle, and then out what valve? Aortic? Yep, good. Aortic semilunar valve. Perfect. So we go out the aortic semilunar valve to the aorta. Um, and then you should probably also remember the, the kind of the pathway that the, the vessels take from there. So you don't need to know all the specific vessels of the body. Obviously, that would be a lot. Um, but know that the aorta is an elastic artery. Um, and a lot of the arteries that branch from the aorta are also considered elastic arteries because they're super stretchy. Remember that every time the heart uh, pumps, that left ventricle pumps, it's creating a lot of force on those vessels, so they need to be able to expand and contract with the, every pulse. Um, so we go from elastic arteries to muscular arteries, uh, and then eventually we get to the small arterioles. Uh, arterioles lead us to capillary beds, capillary beds to venules, uh, and then to small veins, larger veins, uh, and back to the superior and inferior vena cava, which take us back to the right atrium. So just make sure you're, you're refreshing all of that um, cardiovascular knowledge. Uh, in addition to that, um, 
the conducting system, so how the electrical signals are conducted around the heart, there's a pathway there as well. Um, so what's your heart's pacemaker? Myocardium. SA node, or no, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, so that's the sinoatrial node. That's the pacemaker of the heart. Um, where does the message go from there? AV node? Mm-hmm. Yep, goes the, yeah, the AV node or the atrioventricular node. And then where? I'm going to go to the, so there's that middle kind of twist of um, of signaling that goes, it's, it's heading towards the interventricular septum. It's a, it's a bundle. Bundle for, 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 bundle <laughs> for, for gin, whatever. Oh, oh, okay. You're, you're, you're kind of there. Um, so the first, the first step we hit is that bundle of his. Oh, bundle of his. Right bundle of his, and then it separates into the left and right bundle branches. And then as we get down to the apex of the heart and they curve around, then that's when it becomes the Purkinje fibers. Oh, yes, sorry. Okay. All right, so, and remember your, your normal EKG here and how an EKG is just um, measuring uh, the electrical signal. Um, as it's going through the heart. So the P wave represents atrial depolarization. Um, this QRS complex represents ventricular de depolarization and also atrial repolarization is happening in there somewhere. Uh, and then the T wave represents ventricular repolarization. Okay. Um, your heart sounds the love dub. What's what's happening there when you hear it, when you're hearing the heart? What are you actually hearing? Isn't that the uh, valves closing? Yeah. Yes. Very good. Yeah. Um, so the 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 first sound is um, is the atrioventricular valves and then the semilunar valves. Okay. Uh, systole is contraction. Diastole is relaxation. Uh, we, we know that the, that electrical signal moves through the heart uh, quickly because of the connections between the heart cells. So um, intercalated discs that, that create the barriers between adjacent cardiac muscle cells that are full of gap junctions that are able to send that electrical signal quickly um, across the, the muscle tissue there. Okay, so let's think about blood flow and pressure. There are a whole bunch of things, obviously, that, that affect blood flow and pressure. So just throw some, throw some at me. Cardiac output. Okay, so, so cardiac output, um, meaning like the blood volume, that'll affect flow, yeah. The oxygenation and deoxygenation, or I may have just completely butchered that, and I think I did. When so it goes through your it goes through your lungs to get oxygenated or to get oxygen and uh, oh right? okay so I think if you're saying that like if if lung having lung disease can affect it can right so if you have something like um, if you have a buildup of fluid in the lungs then that can affect um, the output um, what else just think about what affects blood pressure. So if I want to control my blood pressure, what do I do? Exercise. Good. Medications. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, so yeah, that certain, certainly some medications can do it. Uh, stress. Stress can cause a difference, can it? Yeah, it can. Why? What does stress do? Isn't it release a hormone? Very good. So if I'm stressed, it's going to be triggering my sympathetic nervous system, which is going to release... Uh, epinephrine from adrenal medulla. What's that going to do to my vessels? Uh, doesn't it constrict them, right? Very good. Yeah. So, so constricting 
Um, just vasoconstriction in general is going to increase pressure. Vasodilation will decrease pressure. Um, blood volume it, um, has a huge effect on pressure. So um, if your uh, if your blood volume is high, then then you'll have higher pressure. If blood volume is low, pressure will be lower. Um, if you've got um, even things like um, like the vessel length, like the, the length of blood vessels in your body, which has to do with body size. Um, so that'll affect pressure as well. So the longer the amount of like vessels you have to go through, the harder your heart has to push to get the, the blood through the, that length of vessels. All right, so yeah, lots of things affecting flow and, and pressure. Okay, and then cardiac output is a specific um, is a specific uh, measurement here. So what's the formula to figure cardiac output? I know it's pressure. Isn't it like pressure dilation? Um, it's not, it's not pressure. It's volume. Good. Um, so stroke volume, which is the, the volume that gets pumped out of the ventricle every beat, and then we have to multiply that times a rate. What rate are we using? The heart rate? Yeah, yeah, just the heart rate. So stroke volume times heart rate equals cardiac output. So it's just the amount of, of blood the heart puts out per minute. Right. So those two, I'm not going to go through and answer all of these, but but I like this question. So the the starling forces that are that are controlling blood flow in and out of the capillaries. Um, what are those two forces? Can you guys see it? Do I need to make it bigger? No, it's good. I'm just blind. So as, as blood is flowing into the capillaries and then it leaves the capillaries and kind of oozes into the tissues, um, what force is pushing that, that plasma into the tissues? Osmotic pressure? Um, that's, that's what's pulling some of it back in. So the blood colloid osmotic pressure is what's pulling some of it back into the bloodstream. Is it hydrostatic pressure? Yeah, yeah. I was gonna say you guys are overthinking it. It's just it's just the the blood hydrostatic pressure that's pushing it out. Okay. All right. Who can name all their leukocytes? Jack, you're being weird. Oh, isn't that uh, basophilus, nitrophilus, uh, NK? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. E starts with an E. Mm -hmm. S Ezo, the one that does parasites. Ezo. Yeah. <laughs> Doing great. Um, wait, wait. Is it the T and B cells? That's some of them, yep. Um, I feel like I'm missing one. I know I'm missing one. Is it is it the lymphocytes, granulocytes, mono, monocytes, and macrophages? Okay, yes, but so let me let me categorize that for you. Okay, so so let's think of it as like a hierarchy here, with leukocytes being white blood cells. That's the top of our pyramid, um, and then we're going to divide that into granulocytes and agranulocytes. The granulocytes are the ones that have granules, so that'd be neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. Right, so remember, neutrophils are your first. Um, those are the, like the, the phagocytic cells that show up first at, at a site of infection. They are the most numerous of the white blood cells. Eosinophils, you're right. Those are the ones for um, parasitic reactions. Um, and then basophils are, um, mediate the, um, the uh, inflammatory response. 
So those are your granulocytes. The A granulocytes on the other side, those would be like lymphocytes and monocytes. Um, so the lymphocytes being your B cells and T cells, monocytes um, uh, are become macrophages when they enter the tissues. So um, that's what belongs on either side of the, the pyramid there. Okay. All right, so I think that's pretty good for cardiovascular. Let's move on to the uh, lymphatic and immune system. Um, so since we just kind of covered this, you have two principal cell types for the adaptive response. What are the two principal cell types for adaptive response? Does that mean like when you get a cut? No, so the adaptive is the specific immune system. Third line of defense. B and T cells? Good, B and T cells. So that's your B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes. Um, let's see. What about components of the inflammatory response? What did you just say? Eat, pain, swelling. Oh. I'm missing one. Redness. Redness, good. Yep, redness, heat, swelling, and pain. Um, and so most of that is, is triggered by um, inflammatory cytokines that are going to do things like um, the uh, increased blood flow to the area, uh, increase the permeability of the capillaries so that we get fluid leaking out, and that's going to encourage diapodesis of the white blood cells. Um, once we start getting basophils to the area, they're going to start releasing histamine and heparin. That's going to create an itchiness and um, increase the, the blood flow. So all that works together to create the inflammatory response. Okay, so given that, all of the, the way that you're, so we're, we're, we say things simply like redness, heat, swelling, and pain. Your, your test is gonna use different words. So I put just a group of, of words there that, um, that you might see. So redness, heat, swelling, and pain, which, which of these? Increased vascular permeability. Good. Tissue injury. Yep. No. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, recruitment of phagocytes. Yep. And it's one of those V words, but I don't know which one. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, vasodilation. The vessel is going to get wider. Okay. Very good. Okay. So two main categories of immunity is just um, innate and adaptive. Um, these are just referring to ways that we gain adaptive immunity. So either act active natural is like getting getting sick uh, and developing your own antibodies against that illness. Active artificial is getting a vaccine. Passive natural is getting antibodies um, from somebody milk. else. Yeah, breast milk. And then passive artificial is the uh, being artificially injected with antibodies. Wouldn't that be like, uh, what is that called? When you get like, stuff injected into your spinal cord or whatever? Um, I don't know that they ever go into your spinal cord. I'm trying to think of which one that would be, because it's like, it's, it's not um, like plasma. My is son it? got plasma like allergy shots. Every week I would have to give him like an allergy shot because he was so allergic to like pollen and stuff like that. So would that be like, not, it wasn't, it was like, wouldn't that be an active artificial though? It wasn't a vaccine. It was like, um, I, I think was give, giving him the pollen that he was allergic to. Right. So you were priming his, his response, um, to, to kind of get used to it. Um, the, the passive artificial is more things like, um, so say, say I'm, I'm really ill with COVID. Um, and I go to the hospital and they inject me with antibodies from somebody who's already recovered from COVID. Okay. So it's, it's, it's giving me the antibodies that somebody else already produced. So things like anti-venom for snake bites uh, comes from that same source. Okay. 
Uh-uh. <laughs> it is a no. Um, okay, so um, for my cell mediated response, which cells are in charge there? B cells, right? Or T, T cells. T cells. T cells. Active, active T cells or just T cells? Yeah, so the T, T helper cells are the ones that are in control of the cell mediated response. Okay. Um, and those T helpers will kind of initiate that cascade with the cytotoxic T's and the regulatory T's and memory T's. Okay. So that leaves the, the B lymphocytes for the humoral. <laughs> um, of, the, of the types of B lymphocytes, which are the ones that are secreting large amounts of antibodies? The B cells. Yes. Specifically, which type of B cells is going to create a whole bunch of them? The B memory. Is that the T helper? No. Wait. Donna, why are you doing? <laughs> Cute. Um, so it's actually the plasma cells. Right? Plasma B cells are the ones that create large amounts of antibodies. Okay, uh, and we should remember our five different types of antibodies. So, is that the IgB, uh, IgD, IgM, IgE, IG, I, IgG? Yeah, which goes through the placenta. <laughs> yeah, I so I, IgG <laughs> is the, yeah, the most numerous. That's the one that goes through the placenta. Um, that's probably your most powerful antibody response against infection. Um, IgG, IgM. right? What's it? Say again. The IgM. So the IgM. What's that one do? Crap. Is that the one that's unknown? No, I think that's Ig. Ig is unknown. IgM is the one that's made first, like a bunch of them, right? Good. Yeah, so IgM is the one that, yeah, when I first get sick, we're going to make a whole bunch of IgM right away. Um, and the then... I IgE, right? I IgE is for what? Parasitic infections. Parasitic infections and... Worms. Allergy. And, and allergy. Allergy. Yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. Um, isn't the, yeah the IgD which is unknown? Yeah, we, we don't really know. They'll they'll make something up, but they don't know. Um, and then IgA. IgA. What's that one do? Is that the first responder? Um, I thought that was IgM. Yeah, IgM is the first responder. IgA is the one that um you find like uh in secretions, so it's like it's, mucus. Yeah, so in mucus and saliva and breast milk is where we're producing a whole bunch of that IgA um, to protect you against, you know, stuff you've already had. All right, and then if our immune system is overreacting to something, what do we call that? Hives. Hives. <laughs> Allergic reaction. That's, so, so both of those, hives and allergy, are a type of of this, but there's a word for the overall overreaction. And there are four different types of overreaction. Oh man. Okay, so the, I'll, I'll just give it to you. The, the type of, so an overreaction is referred to as a hypersensitivity. So it's just overreacting. And then there are four different types and they're just numbered type one through type four. So what's a type one hypersensitivity? That's acute. acute. Like allergies. Allergies, very yeah. good. So, and that one's gonna be IgE mediated. What's a type two? Isn't that a severe reaction? It would be. So it's the blood. Good, very good. Um, so that's the um, 
is a complement induced lysis of foreign cells. So like a whole cell introduced to your body that doesn't, doesn't belong there, like, like a blood transfusion response um, or RH incompatibility. Those would be type two hypersensitivities. Um, what about type three? An autoimmune um, type where it goes on its own cells. Not, yeah, so, good. Yeah, so the type three is the immune complex reactions where we get a whole bunch of those antibody antigen complexes that settle into epithelial layers of tissue and then neutrophils go in and destroy the tissue trying to get the immune complexes. So that's a lot of the autoimmune um, disorders, diseases fall into that category. Uh, and then what's a type four? That's like anaphylactic, right? Now, anaphylaxis falls under type one. Oh. Delayed type of hypersensitivity. Good, delayed. Yeah, so, so those first three are all antibody mediated. The type four is the, the delayed response and that's a T cell mediated. So that's things like um, uh, contact dermatitis, like poison ivy. Um, or it and, takes a long time for it to show signs. Yeah, and like, so graft rejection, any kind of tissue incompatibility after a transplant falls under the, the type four. All right, so moving on to respiratory system. So you guys should be familiar with the pathway that air takes um, as it comes from your nose all the way down to the alveoli. Uh, difference between upper and lower respiratory tract. Conducting zone is just everything up until we hit those respiratory bronchioles. Uh, what's the difference between ventilation and respiration? Ventilation is like the actual um, breathing process and respiration is the gas exchange. Very good, yeah. Yeah, so ventilation is air in, air out, inhalation, exhalation, and respiration is gas exchange, very good. Um, we've got two types of respiration. They're happening in two different places in the body. What are those? The alveoli or? however you pronounce it, and um, in the capillaries, maybe? Good. Yeah, so, so the, first, the first type is that external respiration that happens between the alveoli and the pulmonary capillaries. So that's where the oxygen's leaving the alveolus and going into the capillaries, and the carbon dioxide's leaving the capillaries and going into the alveolus. Uh, and then internal respiration, is what's happening at the level of the tissues. So now that oxygen is getting carried all around the body, finds its way to a capillary bed, diffuses into the tissues um, so that they can uh, produce ATP. Okay. What about muscles? So if I wanna take a normal relaxed breath in and out, what muscles are involved in resting inhalation? Abdominal? Not, not for just a nor <laughs> normal resting breath. It's up here in your chest, right? Well, it's all your chest muscles that are helping. Correct. So that would be for like if we're forcing it, but what if you're just like sitting there and just taking a normal breath? What's the main muscle of breathing? Diaphragm. Very good, yeah. So the diaphragm um, starts off dome-shaped and then as it contracts, it flattens to expand the thoracic cavity. So diaphragm and then the external intercostals. So those are the ones for normal inhalation. Um, and then when you want to do a normal exhale, all you have to do is relax those two muscles, nothing else required. Um, so it's only when we're doing um, forced inhalation and forced exhalation that we're going to recruit some other muscles in there. So I'm, if I'm doing a forced inhale, no one's here. We're doing a forced inhale. Uh, what muscles are we going to use for that? So isn't that the abdominal then? 
Not for, not for inhale, no. No one here. For okay, abdominals for exhale, inhale would be your chest. Then right. right? Yeah, so so muscles that are gonna help open the thoracic cavity wider are gonna be things like um, sternocleidomastoid here is going to help pull up the sternum um, and accessory muscles with the SEM or the scalenes in the neck here. That's all going to pull the sternum up to expand the thoracic cavity. Um, and also um, uh, uh, pectoralis minor. So pectoralis minor is going to help expand this way. So it's basically all like this junction right yeah, here. Yeah, all, all up in here to kind of lift up. Right. And then if we want to forcefully exhale, so if, if you think about it and do a forceful exhale and kind of push everything out, that's where your abs come in. Um, and then also the, the internal intercostals play a role there as well by, by pulling the ribs down um, so that you can force air out. Okay. All right, um, so as far as the vasculature here, so um, the, the vessels that are bringing deoxygenated blood to the lungs. Veins. Veins. Veins, she said. Veins. Um, Is it the pulmonary artery? Those are pulmonary arteries, right? So pulmonary arteries are bringing the deoxygenated blood to the lungs to pick up mm -hmm. oxygen. Uh, and then the ones that are re removing that now oxygenated blood or pulmonary veins. So, so that's, um, I get why you said veins and that's because this yeah, is the whole thing. Yeah, this is the place in the body where they're reversed. Um, so if those are the ones that are bringing um, the deoxygenated blood to the lungs, which are the ones that are bringing oxygenated blood to actually feed the lung tissue? Arteries? It's gonna be arteries, yeah. But what which ones? Starts with a B. B. What's the next letter? <laughs> R. Fro at the bronchioles. Bronchial, yeah. Really? <laughs> yeah. Good, so bronchial arteries are the ones that are actually supplying the lungs with their own oxygen. Okay, we talked about the respiration. What is the proportion of oxygen in the atmosphere? Is it nitrogen and CO2 and, right? Yeah, so it's nitrogen first at about 70 some percent. Anytime I put a really specific question on here, on these study guides, you know why I did that, right? Because you don't like us? <laughs> well, on the test. Yeah, it's because I love you, <laughs> is why. Because uh, um, isn't the proportion of the, the oxygen in the atmosphere when you're talking about the acute mountain sickness, you yeah. the oxygen goes down and then how your body reacts to it? So someone should look this up because I can't I can't even remember off the top of my head what the proportion is. It's like twenty some percent. Twenty three? Twenty sure. I'll, I'll take your word for it. But someone look that up and make sure you know that um, that actual proportion. Because that I don't know why you would need to know something so specific, but what you do. Um Okay, so once we get that oxygen into the bloodstream, how are we carrying it? How is it transported? It's 21%. 21, perfect. 21% proportion of oxygen in the atmosphere. Thank you. How is oxygen carried through the blood? Mm -hmm. Isn't it with the, it's our blood cells? It attaches, to, it attaches to a hemoglobin. Good. Yeah, so it's going to attach to hemoglobin, and the hemoglobin is inside the red blood cells. 
right? So every hemoglobin molecule can carry four oxygen molecules, and you've got a couple hundred million hemoglobin molecules in every single red blood cell. So that's how, we're, we're, that's how most oxygen is transported. Um, what about carbon dioxide? It's a little bit different. Oh. Isn't that carried in the fluid outside? Y yeah, so most of it is not going to be carried on the hemoglobin. So about a quarter of it gets carried on hemoglobin. Like but yeah, most of it gets um, uh, when it combines. So when so this is where that equation comes into place. So remember, when carbon dioxide combines with water, we get carbonic acid. And then the carbonic acid dissociates into a hydrogen ion and a bicarbonate ion. So most of the carbon dioxide in your bloodstream at any given time is going to be in the form of that bicarbonate ion. And then a small fraction of it is just dissolved as a gas, little tiny gas bubbles. All right, and then uh, just remembering the basics of all the terminology associated with spirometry here. So your vital capacity, that's just a normal volume of a, a or I'm sorry, not tidal volume is just a normal inhale, exhale, so tidal breath in and out. Um, your vital capacity is going to be the maximum amount of air that you can pass through your lungs. So that's if you take the biggest breath in and then the biggest breath out is going to be uh, vital capacity. So that's a combination of your um, inspiratory reserve volume, your tidal volume, and your expiratory reserve volume. So if you add those three together, you get vital capacity. Um, and then even after you've taken that biggest exhale possible, there's still a little bit of, of oxygen left in your lungs otherwise, or gas, I should say, left in your lungs, otherwise they'd collapse. Um, so that leftover gas is the residual volume. All right. So moving on to digestive system. So processes involved with mechanical digestion. This seemed to really throw people um, as I was reading through the, the labs for this one. The mechanical digestion, that's when you're chewing. Chewing is one of them. Um, swallowing. So, swallowing, what's the fancy word for swallowing? Deglutition. Very good, deglutition. Um. After we swallow it, what happens? Peristalsis. Peristalsis. Yeah, which is the movement down your esophagus. <clears throat> Excuse me. What happens in the stomach? What mechanically is going on there? The acid. <laughs> yeah, Alicia's doing it, yeah. That's My called stomach's churning, Ugh. right? Yeah. Constriction, is that what it is? It's, it's called churning. Oh. Yeah. So mastication, deglutition, peristalsis, churning, and then what is happening in the small intestine specifically where we're kind of blocking Absorption. off? Well, that's, that's definitely the main thing that it's doing. Oh, it but starts with a P. It starts with a P, doesn't it? It starts with an S. It starts with an S. Oh, so S-E-M-S, no, not somatic. It's um, it's segmentation. Where it creates a little, the, yeah, it creates a little segments and then mix the stuff together in those tiny segments and then move it to the next segment. All right, so that's all mechanical. Right? Nothing uh, chemical involved there. When we move over to chemical digestion, then there's a number of enzymes that are working to help um, chemically break down that food. All right, so um, so throw some at me. What are some uh, enzymes? Bile. So um, bile is good. So bile is going to help us um, emulsify, uh, <coughs> excuse me, emulsify fats in the small intestine and the duodenum. Saliva. What's in the saliva? To break the food down, right? Absorb the nutrients, but I don't know what it's called. It's 
it has like limeys or something in it. <laughs> good, 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 good. Yeah, so there's a couple enzymes know. in the saliva. Those are um, salivary amylase. So salivary amylase starts the breakdown of, of carbohydrates in the mouth. Uh, and then you've also got lingual lipase. Lingual lipase um, doesn't actually do anything in the mouth, but it's secreted there. And then as you swallow the lingual lipase with the food, um, it gets activated in the stomach by the low pH of the stomach acid. So those are the two enzymes there. Um, and then you've got, there's, there's a whole mess of, of different enzymes that are working um, in the stomach, enzymes that are created by the pancreas um, to help uh, break down different chemicals. So remember, or to break down different molecules. We've got to break down the carbohydrates. We've got to break down the proteins, the fats, uh, and the nucleic acids. Was it the, the lipase, right? Yeah. It's breaking down the, the lipids, amino acids. So things like, food. yeah, like pepsin. Pepsin helps to yeah. break down proteins into amino acids. Um, a lot of it is just the hydrochloric acid in the stomach helps to break down, um, do some initial breakdown of that, those uh, proteins and fats. Okay. Well, let's do this one. The order of food through the digestive tract. So, so I'm chewing food in the mouth. Where does it go next? Into your esophagus? Not yet. Like the pharyngeal, the esophagus. Through the epiglottis. Okay. So, yeah, I'm hearing some right answers. <laughs> so, so mouth to the first part of the pharynx is, that we hit for food is? The ortho. Oropharynx, right. good. Okay. So we go oropharynx and then laryngopharynx and then we're gonna the, you're right the the epiglottis is going to close so that food does not enter the trachea and mm -hmm. then we go into the esophagus and then the, it's the esophagus to the stomach yeah what's the doorway the the valve the sphincter between the esophagus and the stomach is there sort of the car the right okay Got like four Car different names that's one of them, yeah. Cardial or whatever. Yeah. Um, so that's either the cardioesophageal sphincter, cardiac sphincter, lower esophageal sphincter. I don't know why it has so many names, but it does. So that's the doorway between the esophagus and the stomach. Um, what's, what's the doorway out of the stomach? The, re the uh, pylor renal. sphincter. Good, pyloric sphincter. And then after we pass through the pyloric sphincter, um, actually, what triggers the opening of the pyloric sphincter? How do we know when it's time to move food into the next it, when step? When the pH balance lows. Perfect. Killing it, stomach. Angela. Yeah. Yeah. So when, yeah, when the pH of the contents of the stomach get to around two or three, so very, very low, um, that's what's going to trigger the opening of the pyloric sphincter. And then where does food go next? It's the duodenum. Right, yeah, into the small intestine, the first part of which is the duodenum. Yeah. All right, so now we're in the duodenum. We're going to involve some of the accessory organs here. So we've got, um, we've got some exocrine products entering the tube, entering the duodenum. Where are, they, where are these accessory products coming from? The pancreas. Good. The liver. Get, mm -hmm. Liver. Is it the gallbladder? Perfect. Yep. So all three of those are going to be contributing um, their exocrine products to the duodenum here. So pancreas is going to be contributing um, some pancreatic enzymes that are going to help um, with the breakdown of, uh, of carbs, lipids, and proteins. Um, pancreas is also going to release something to help us neutralize the acid here. Um, so uh, does anyone remember what that is? So it's just bicarbonate. The, the pancreas is gonna release some bicarbonate. 
um, and that's going to help neutralize the acid because while while we want a really acidic um, chyme in the stomach, we don't want it to be so acidic in the in the small intestine because that'll just eat right through the duodenum. So we have to neutralize the acid there. Um, what's coming from the liver and the gallbladder? Bile. The gallbladder's bile. Yeah. Yeah, it's actually both, right? So the liver is making the bile, uh, and any extra bile gets backed up into the, the gallbladder where it's stored and concentrated. Okay, so after the duodenum, then what's the next part of the tube? Ilium and jejunum. Ju ju yeah. So yeah, jejunum next, jejunum. and then and then ilium is the last part of the small intestine. What's what's the doorway at the end of the ilium called? Is that a sphincter again? Renal sphincter. Yeah, so that one is the ileocecal valve. So ileocecal valve is the, the doorway at the end of the ilium. Um, and just by the name of it, where does it where does that doorway lead you to? Sphinx the say that again. <laughs> the Goes ileo to the ileum. Yeah. So from the ileum to the cecum. Cecum. Yeah, the cecum. So the cecum is the first part of your large intestine. Right, so we enter the cecum, uh, and then we're going to move up. What's that part of the colon called? Ascending. Ascending, and then transverse, transverse, and then descending, descending, and then sigmoid, and then the rectum, rectum, and then anus. Anus, yeah. Very good. All right, so I think we handled most of that. All right, um, so difference between absorptive state and post-absorptive. Uh, so absorptive is just what's happening when, like right after you've eaten a meal and you're actually absorbing um, those nutrients into the bloodstream. Uh, post-absorptive, so in the absorptive state, your body is releasing a bunch of insulin to help you get those, that sugar, that glucose that's now in your bloodstream into your cells, post-absorptive state happens later after a several hours past a meal where your, your, um, your blood sugar is dropping low because it's been a while since you've eaten, so pancreas will start releasing glucagon. Okay, why is the absorption of lipids different from other molecules? Lipids are fats. They sure are. What, what is that? How are they absorbed differently? Where do they go first? Well, lipids are made into energy, correct? They are. So, where is most of so, um, like, uh, mo most of the digestion happens in the small intestine of lipids, yeah. Yeah, so that's where the, what is it, segmentation? Yeah, but how are they entering, how are they, basically, how are these lipids leaving um, the tube and entering into the body? Bloodstream. Yeah, so they're not going directly into the bloodstream. So whereas amino acids, nucleotides, um, monosaccharides, those can all be absorbed directly into the bloodstream through the uh, capillary beds in the in the villi, um, the lipids can't go directly into the bloodstream. They're too big. Where do they go first? Liver. Sorry. Not the liver. How do they get it? So if they can't go into the blood, where are they going? Into the cells, right? The they can't get in there yet. Kidneys. Plasma? I don't know. I, I like that we're just, we're, we're trying our best. Um, so uh, remember, it's going to take you back to your lymphatic system. Remember that we have little tiny vessels called lacteals, and those are the lymphatic vessels associated with the small intestine. 
So uh, lipids get absorbed into the lacteals first. So they go into your lymphatic system um, before they can re-enter the bloodstream. They're just too big to enter into those um, the capillary beds at that point. So they go into lacteals. And then that, that combination of lymph plus lipids is called chyle. All right. I remember chyle. Okay, <laughs> good. All right, what about steps of cellular respiration? Give me four steps. Like colises? Good. Mm -hmm. So glycolysis is the first step where we're breaking uh, glucose down into two pyruvate molecules. So pyruvate oxidation? What'd you ask? <laughs> so, so after glycolysis, the next step. So we have to convert that pyruvate into something. Uh, sit, carb, no. Car, car, it, it was an H2CO3 or something, right? Sit, so. It goes into, um, damn it. SADH or something that turns it into. Right? I'm having a great time this morning. You guys are wonderful. <laughs> Um, so the it, so I, everyone hates this. Um, so we we go from uh, glycolysis. The next step is the preparatory reactions, or sometimes just called the acetyl CoA, because then we're going to convert that pyruvate molecule into acetyl CoA, acetyl coenzyme A, and then that's going to enter into the the next step of of the process, which is the cycle. What's the cycle called? Citric acid. Krebs cycle? Krebs. Yeah, Krebs cycle. Perfect. Both of those are correct. It's called either citric acid cycle or Krebs cycle. Right. So after the Krebs cycle, then what's the last step? The electric something. Yes, good. Electron transport chain. Yeah. Right. So it might, might be a good idea to just review those steps and look at the inputs and the outputs, what's going in and out of each of those four steps. Okay. Hey, what are vitamins? <laughs> vitamins are key nutrients to help our body, like vitamin A, B, C, D, they kind of help give us energy, like getting our body the proper, right? Yes. So they are, they're, they're key, uh, what we refer to as micronutrients. Um, so, so vitamins and minerals are both micronutrients. Um, so it, let me just back up and make sure that we understand. Um, you've got these these six categories of nutrients, right? So we've got we've got your your macronutrients, which is things like lipids and um, uh, proteins and carbohydrates, and then you've got micronutrients, which is vitamins and minerals, and then the last one, the sixth one, is just water, right? So so macronutrients, micronutrients, and water. These micronutrients we divide into vitamins and minerals. Vitamins are organic molecules. Minerals are inorganic molecules, just mostly metal ions. Right, so these organic vitamins, um, they, the, most of them act as um, uh, coenzymes. Right? So they act as coenzymes, so that's how they're contributing to your metabolism. Um, and specifically, I think when you're talking about energy, you're referring to the B vitamins. So the B vitamins um, do contribute a lot to, um, to your energy levels because, because the B vitamins are basically the, the NAD, the FAD, H that are part of the, um, that are part of cellular respiration. Okay. All right, moving on to urinary. What does your urinary system do? Mm -hmm. Urine. 
gets rid of all of the stuff that you don't need in your body. The wastes. Great. Filters wastes. Very good. What's another key thing that it does? Regulates blood volume. Does it keep you from being yeah. dehydrated? Yeah, I heard I heard regulate blood volume. So it's going to help regulate blood volume, blood pressure, and fluid balance, also helping to control the pH of the blood. So it's, it's actually doing a lot um, in addition to filtering waste. All right, so pathway from the kidney out of the body. So once I've created urine in the kidney, where does that urine go next? The ureter? It goes to the pyramid. Yeah, so we go, next step is the ureter. Ureter goes to? The bladder. Bladder, bladder goes to? Urethra. Urethra, perfect. All right, so that's the gross anatomy. Now, now let's get into the, the nephron. All right, so um, nephrons are the functional units of the kidney. So those what we've got a, a million of in each kidney. It starts with, the, um, with in Bowman's capsule. Right, so, or the renal corpuscle. So renal corpuscle is composed of Bowman's capsule and the glomerulus. Um, the glomerulus is that ball of capillaries where we start the um, filtration process. Where do we go after we leave the glomerulus? Where does the filtrate go? A theory? The pyramid? Not yet. PCT. Good, PCT. So we go from the glomerulus to the proximal convoluted tubule. Then the proximal convoluted tubule is all convoluted and then it goes down to, to the loop of Henle. Loop of Henle and then back up to the DCT. Distal convoluted tubule, good. And then to the uh, um, conduct duct or collecting duct. Um, good. Collecting duct. Perfect. Uh, and the collecting duct takes us to? The papillary. Good, renal papilla. Uh, and then those um, papilla are gonna merge together to form our tiny funnels. What are those called? Minor um, calyx, calyces. Good. Good, minor calyces. Minor calyces merge together to form Major calyces. Major calyces. You guys are killing the kidneys here. Um, and then major calyces, all empty. Renal and pelvis. Renal pelvis. Perfect. All right. Excellent. All right. So that's the pathway that the filtrate takes. Um, and so throughout that process, there's there are these three major steps: um, the filtration, uh, glomerular filtration, tubular reabsorption, and tubular secretion. So the glomerular filtration is the first step of that process where we're just, we're filtering almost everything out of the blood. We're just taking everything out. Um, so, and that's going to include all the waste, but we're also taking out some good things like, um, like sugars, um, important uh, electrolytes and things like that. We suck everything out into that filtrate. Uh, and then the reabsorption is taking the good stuff and putting it back into the bloodstream. So moving the sugars back into the bloodstream, moving a whole bunch of important ions back into the bloodstream and a lot of water as well goes back into the bloodstream. And then the last step of that is the tubular secretion where we're just kind of fine tuning what's in the urine versus what stays in the blood. So a little, little um, fine control of the pH is happening here. So if the blood is a little bit acidic, we might pump some more hydrogen ions out We'll secrete them back out into the into the filtrate. If the um, if we need, you know, this is where we'll kind of take a look at the the um, the concentration of the urine. Do we need to move more water in, more water out, things like that? Okay. Um, net filtration pressure. What are the components that go into measuring net filtration pressure? Um, 
um, the net filtration is the hydrostatic, um, the colloid, the hydrostatic pressure, um, the colloid pressure, and the osmotic. I forget the last one. Yeah, yeah. So you're 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 definitely on the right track. So it's the that glomerular hydrostatic pressure is pushing stuff out of the glomerular capillaries and into the capsule. Um, bl the blood colloid osmotic pressure is sucking some of that fluid back into the glomerulus, uh, and then also the capsular hydrostatic pressure. So just the pressure of the the fluid in the capsule itself is pushing stuff back in. So if you take blood hydrostatic minus blood colloid osmotic minus capsular, that gives you your net filtration pressure. Okay, um, and then you guys should be familiar with those different hormones and how they work to maintain uh, blood pressure um, and uh, fluid balance. Um, so how does antidiuretic hormone work? It makes you pee. No, it doesn't. It, it will it decrease. Um, it retains sodium, right? It makes it. Does it um, increase reabsorption? Reabsorption and um. Yes. Decrease, decrease like the water or the output. The urine. Yeah, yeah. So, so the antidiuretic hormone is the one that is kind of independent of the electrolytes. It works directly on water. So antidiuretic hormone is going to help you retain water. Um, so it increases reabsorption of water in the collecting ducts. Um, what about aldosterone? Um, we absorb sodium. Good. Yeah, so that's gonna, um, it, it's gonna work on the electrolyte balance. So it's gonna do things like reabsorb sodium and chloride. Um, and that's going to help increase blood pressure. Uh, what does uh, atrial natriuretic peptide or ANP do? Suppresses reabsorption of sodium. Good, right. So that's going to um, increase the sodium output in the urine, which is going to increase water output, which is going to reduce blood pressure. And then what about angiotensin II? It's got a, a few different functions. Hmm. Reabsorption of water. Right, so it's going to encourage um, reabsorption of water. What else is it going to do? The GFR? The, uh... Uh, yeah, in a way, yeah, it is, it is going to control that because it's going to, um, it's, uh, it's going to do vasoconstriction. Uh, and the last thing it's going to do is trigger the release of aldosterone. So that's what angiotensin II does. Um, what about renin? When do we release renin? When there's a, when the kidneys notice that there's like low blood pressure. Perfect. Yep. Kidneys notice low blood pressure, they'll, they'll release renin. What about EPO? So is EPO is that used for oxygen, right? Good, good, good. Yeah, good. So erythropoietin is released by the kidneys when um, when the oxygen is low, um, and so that will that signal goes to the bone marrow to create more red blood cells. All right. Um, we'll move along here. Let's get to the reproductive system. So basics, um, what are the gonads? The ovaries and the testes. Very good, yep. So testes for males, ovaries for females. Um, uh, and then you should, you know, familiarize yourself with the other structures of the reproductive system for both males and females that <clears throat> that are accessories to the gonads. So basically like the tubes that are attached to those gonads um, for the males and then the tubes that are attached to the gonads for the females. 
Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, um, and also these processes. So, um, so how are spermatozoa produced? How do we make sperm? What's the name of the process for making sperm? The genesis. Yeah, so that's the spermatogenesis. And then for um, for making oocytes, for making eggs. Making what? So that's um that's oogenesis. All right. Um, I imagine you guys haven't had much time to, to get into the reproductive systems yet, so that's okay. Um, what are lactiferous sinuses? Just a guess. The what? Lactiferous sinuses. It has something to do with breast milk? For sure. Yep, lactiferous sinuses is where, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, is where, where milk is directed. Um, to the nipple. Um, what about the, the hormonal involvement here? So throw out some hormones that are important. Testosterone. Testosterone progesterone and estrogen. Very good. All right, so, um, so as far as those hormones, um, the testosterone is produced in the testes, the estrogen and progesterone is produced in the ovaries, um, but the those hormones, what, tr what hormone triggers the gonads to produce those hormones? Androgen. Oh, what? So, so we get a signal from the anterior pituitary that tells the gonads to release these hormones. So what's, what's the hormone that comes from the anterior pituitary? Is it the follicles? No, it's not. The, uh, Close, it's the other one. The... Starts with an L. Luteinizing hormone? Very good. Yeah, so luteinizing um, hormone. Damn it. <laughs> luteinizing hormone um, released from the anterior pituitary tells the gonads. It, it, it's, it's spelled like L E U. Yes. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, so that's the luteinizing. Um, now, the follicle stimulating hormone. Um, is also important. That's one, that one is going to help, um, whereas the luteinizing hormone helps direct the production of the hormones, follicle stimulating hormone helps direct the production of the actual gametes. So follicle stimulating hormone is what triggers production of sperm and egg. Okay. Uh, parts of a sperm cell. Tail and head. <laughs> yeah, so we've got um, the head of the sperm has a, a tip to it. What's the tip of it called? <laughs> yeah, sorry. Right. It's called the acrosome. So the acrosome is the is the tip of the head, and that's what allows it to gain entry into the to the egg. Um, Inside the, the head of the sperm, what do we find in there? There isn't much. Uh, since it's so nucleus. So yeah, they're, they're gonna have um, a nucleus that's gonna have uh, 23 chromosomes. And then really the only other thing that's in there is a whole bunch of mitochondria um, so that they can power the tail, right? And so this is the only um, flagellated cell uh, that humans have. It's also the smallest cell. They're really tiny. All right. Um, days in a full-term pregnancy. Another one of those weirdly specific questions, like you're supposed to memorize this this exact number of days. It's two something, right? Sure is. I believe it's two seventy. Um, what about stages of labor? Contraction. Okay. I'm trying to remember the names of them off the top of my head now too, and I don't, it just, it, 
just completely escaped my brain. 280 days. 80? Okay. 280. Oh, the cervic cervical dilation. Good. Expulsion. This, good. I did the realize it last night. Uh and the expulsion. The first stage is the thinning. Right, so cer cervical dilation. The second then, stage is labor. Well, yeah, expulsion. The third stage is after birth. Yeah, I don't know why, like the names, the names always throw me off. So cervical dilation makes sense. Expulsion is a really gross word to describe the delivery of a baby. Um, and then, and then the last is the, is they call delivery of the afterbirth. Why, why we're so careful with the delivery of the placenta, I don't know, but um, it, in terms of vocabulary, but yeah, those are the three stages. Uh, and then um, chromosomes in a sperm cell, I just said it as 23. How about in a zygote? 23. So the zygote is the combination of the sperm and the egg. Oh, so... 46? 46. Good. Excellent. All right, so we didn't answer all the questions, but we kind of did a brief overview of, well, probably not quite so brief, overview of what, what's going to be, what you should walk away from this course knowing. Um, any questions? Oh, what kind of what kind of test is the final test? Is it multiple choice again? Yes. Yep. So it'll be the same format as all of your quizzes. Um, I believe it is fifty questions. Um, each question is worth two points, so it's a hundred points, making it ten percent of your grade. Mm -hmm. oh. Okay. Right, and also remember that before. Uh, before Monday, you should um, you should do the Unit Seven quiz, uh, and that one you do. I already gave you the password. You just do it on your own. Use all of your notes. Use whatever you want. Make sure that you get an A on that quiz. Oh man, uh, I'm having a hard time like understanding the questions because I suck at multiple choice like type of tests. Like, uh, so, uh, no yeah, so multiple choice testing is definitely a, a skill. It's a learned skill. Um, and so some people are, are kind of naturally good at that skill and then other people are not. And it's through no fault of your own. <laughs> yeah. Some, sometimes they're just hard to interpret. Um, I find some of the, the the way that they phrase these questions on the on the test that they give you guys are a little bit tricky. Yes. Yeah. Um, just you know that really that's read. What's that? You have to really read what they're saying because you can read it quickly and it it'll be like the opposite of what you read. <laughs> I've had that several times. Right. Yeah, okay. exactly. But I'll put the opposite because the way I yeah, so definitely take, take your time. Mm -hmm. what, what's that? I said don't second guess yourself because I always mark the answer wrong when I second guess myself. That's yeah. Time. yeah, so it's it's definitely a fine line between taking your time and reading the question thoroughly, um, but then not overdoing it where you're overthinking it and second guessing yourself, right? There's a there's a happy medium there where you kind of once you want you feel like you understand the question, go with go with your initial gut response. Um, don't don't sit back and overthink it because then then yeah, like Alicia said, you you kind of you second guess yourself, you change your answer, and a lot of times that second answer is wrong. Most of the time. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Do something calming before the test. Oh. Don't panic. Because if you panic going into it and you worry, then you're just going to sit there and stare at that first question like, 
I have no idea what's going on. Do something <laughs> relaxing. Either take a shower, you know, listen to good some good quiet music, get a cup of coffee, get some tea in you, whatever you need to do to relax. Relax first. And then I think it. that's a really good point. So um a lot of people like in the so we had this review session with micro yesterday. And a lot of students mentioned that, you know, they're kind of nervous about taking an exam in their home because there's so many distractions, right? Um, so when I, when I was doing this, this review session yesterday with Micro, my dog started barking at a dog out the window, and then he freaked himself out so much he had a seizure and fell over. My kid was coming in. Everything was going haywire. And, like, that's the kind of stuff that you, you probably don't have too much control over. So try to, you know, make, make a quiet space for yourself where you're going to be able to focus on the test. But the, the, the benefit of this, the benefit of being able to do it from home is what Paige just said, right? That you, you can control some of the environment, right? You can light some candles, you can make yourself a cup of tea, you can be in your comfy pajamas, you can, you know, really kind of curate your environment to make it as calming as possible for you. So, so pluses and, and minuses of being at home. I have six dogs, so that's impossible for me. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> I've just got the one and two cats, but they're the dog is an old old man and the cats are young and crazy, so it's it's a between his seizures and, and freaking out and the cats doing their they're chasing each other around cat tornado stuff. It's it's mm. a mess. And then two kids. Yeah, my house is a zoo. Right. So, hear that. Yeah, do as best as you can to, to, to make a little quiet space for you. I know it's not always possible, but. So any other questions before I let you guys go? Oh. I have a hard time re uh, doing the ECG, like uh, re reading the ECG. It's confusing. Okay, let's take a look at it. Yeah. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. Yeah, so for, for this particular class, you, you don't need to, to really read into too many of the different um, like problematic EKGs or ECGs. You just need to know the basics. So as, far as, as long as you understand that the P wave represents the atrial depolarization that's good, right? So that's a um, that's the reversal of the membrane potential in the cells of the atria, um, and then the QRS is for the ventricular depolarization and the repolarization of the atria. And the reason that it's so big is because those the ventricles are much more powerful, right? So there's a stronger electrical signal coming from there. Um, and then in all that mess, the, the atria are, are repolarizing. So your atria are depolarizing and then ventricles depolarize. And then as those ventricles are depolarizing, the atria are repolarizing. And then the T wave represents the, the ventricular repolarization. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right, any other questions? Okay, you guys, let me know if something comes up or if you have any questions. I know this is a lot to get done in the last week here. So you got that unit seven assessment, you got your unit seven quiz, the unit seven lab, the unit seven discussion, um, and then you got to finish doing the study guide and turn that in as your unit eight discussion. It's a lot, but we're so close to the end. So just, you know, keep your heads down and, and you'll get there. And by, by Tuesday, you'll be relieved. Um, I have something to say. Yeah. Um, it's about the bio digital on the lab. I noticed that on um, lab seven, there's a few things that we need to do with bio digital. And for some reason, I don't know if it's like the herzing website or if it's my computer, but my bio digital, it doesn't work good. Like it won't let me like dissect all the way into an organ like it did before. And I don't know if it's my computer because that's the only thing that's wrong but i just wanted to know if like anybody else was having that problem because i can only go so far like when i'm um, zooming in to try to label the different parts but 
Is, is anyone else running into that problem? Yeah. Me too. Um, I just get to as close as I can to whatever I need to label and change the name because I get so frustrated trying to find the exact thing. Yeah, because trying to move that thing around sometimes is just mm -hmm. a literal nightmare. Yeah. You're trying, like with my computer, I use my fingers to touch it and to move it around. And if you move it, like, in just an accident, you are just in a completely different region. So just trying yeah. to get as close as possible. Yeah. That's and what I, I did. That's yeah. what I did with the um, Unit 6 lab. I really couldn't dissect all the way into it. So I just kind of clicked on where I knew that it would be. And um, I, I relabeled it, but I don't know if I'll get like points deducted or anything because it like wasn't the original name on, no. I think we were doing the um, kidney at that point. Yeah, so I've been, I've been uh, pretty lenient on the grading of the, that labeling in BioDigital just because I, I've, I've heard so many complaints about how difficult it is to navigate. So if you are anywhere in the ballpark, I usually give you credit for it, right? Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. so so just do your best, but don't don't do it so much that it completely stresses you out. If it starts to make you crazy, just just you know get somewhere close, put, drop that label, and move on. Okay. Okay. Anything else? Can you post this to YouTube? Because every time I try to open the recording, it does not open for me. Yes. So um, so I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording now.